Welcome to another CO2 Monday. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews. This week, I thought we'd bring it back to the basics. So what we have here is uh, on this, anyone who is watching is I got a slide of uh, how a transcritical booster system works, And I'm going to walk through it step by step. So if you're listening on the podcast, you'll have a good idea of what is happening because this is very key. So if you're looking at the screen, we get this point one. So point one, if you think about the enthalpy diagram or the pH log diagram, and I'm going to call it the log diagram going forward, is that you have that, the, the first step is going from your suction to your discharge. So you have that low pressure CO2 uh, vapor going into a high pressure CO2 vapor. So in this example here, we're at about say 400 PSI, probably 35 bar ish. And you're going into that transcritical mode. So you're in the middle of summer, it's 45 Celsius, 110 degrees Fahrenheit out. And all of a sudden you're going right into critical above the critical point. So this is where this point one is above, it's on the discharge side. This is the high stage compression discharge. This is where that refrigerant has been compressed and it's out of the discharge valve. And now it's at the highest temperature and highest pressure in the system. And then from there, depending on the ambient conditions will depend on what that pressure is. So you could be in a range of 1400 PSI, hundred bar, depending what the ambient temperature is outside. And so this is also the inlet of the gas cooler. So like I mentioned earlier, when people ask me, well, when does it turn into a fluid? It actually turns to a fluid in the gas cooler. It's still a vapor going up into the gas cooler. It needs that the airflow across the gas cooler to, to, to turn it into that super critical fluid. And that's something that I learned this week, which is, which is amazing. It needs that air to go across. And then as it goes through the gas cooler, it's cooled down. So from one to two, as you see on these points here, when we go from one to two, this is actually where the gas cooler condenser is and 2.2 is at the outlet. So this is actually the heat that has been removed from the refrigerant in that gas cooler. And in transcritical mode, all you can do is reduce the heat, reject the heat as much as possible because you're not gonna turn that into a liquid or a gas. That really only happens if it's a condenser, if you're in that subcritical zone or mode, you're below that critical point. And at that point down that drop leg, leaving the, your gas cooler condenser, you would have a uh, liquid leaving. So it's important to understand that. And when it is uh, the certain fluid, or is it a gas or is it a liquid or a vapor? After we go from two to three in this diagram, now we're going through that high pressure valve. The, the high pressure valve and the flash gas bypass valve are the two most important valves. And that this high pressure valve, this throttling valve, you're reducing it. So you, now we got a high pressure, high temperature fluid coming down into it when you're above the critical point. And now that valve reduces that pressure, which in turn reduces the temperature. Now you have a liquid and vapor coming out of that high pressure valve, which is what is needed because we need in that flash tank, we need a good, stable pressure as well as good quality liquid in there because inside the, the flash tank, which is 0.3 there, that's where it goes into, you need to have that very stable. And it has to be stable at all times because when you're in transcritical mode, when you have a fluid on the upstream side of that high pressure valve, going into that flash tank, you're going to have more flash gas than liquid. When you're in subcritical condenser uh, mode, you're below the critical point, you're going to have more liquid than vapor or flash gas. And this is why when you're in transcritical all the time, that's where it's less efficient. That's why there's a ton of high ambient strategy. But depending on where you are, the ambient is or where your system is running, you could have more liquid or less liquid going into that flash tank receiver because the liquid is denser. It's going to drop to the bottom and that's where your liquid line comes out or your vapors and flash gases on the top. And that goes, the vapor goes out to uh, and back to your medium temp compressors. And when you have more vapor inside there, that flash gas bypass valve has to open more. And then the system just does more work and there's more consumption. But when you leave that one, we got 0.4 here. When you see 0.4, now this here is the leaving liquid from the bottom of that flash tank receiver. And this here is going out to your metering devices. 
going to your medium temp as well as your low temp, depending on the design of the system, because there are systems out there that you'll have separate liquid line for your low temp, liquid temp line for your medium temp on CO2. But most of them, most of the booster systems, you just got that one liquid line going out both to your medium and your low temp. So you got to be aware of this. The design of the system is so, so important. But you need to make sure, though, you also understand the sequence of operation of all the systems you're working at, depending on who you're working on. If you're working on a, an advanced or if you're working on system LMP, if you're working on uh, Hussman, if you're working on Kaiser Warren, if you're working on ZeroZone, I can go through a list of dozen or more CO2 manufacturers, but you need to understand how their system is set up. Because if you don't follow their setup procedures, you're going to run into issues down the road especially when you want to start to fine tune the system. And that is so important when I'm seeing more and more systems get commissioned. Okay. The problem is they're not getting fine tuned afterwards. And this is where more end users need to be involved and understand that there's a lot more costs to not only buying the equipment, but getting that equipment to run a properly and effectively because the CO2 systems I see that are set up and commissioned from day one correctly but then they go back and fine tune it. Those ones are the ones that work the best, the ones that are saving a huge amount of energy. Um, and we need to do that more. When we look at point five, this is after the medium temp uh, metering device. This is what we're going to call the, the entering medium temperature evaporators. This, this liquid refrigerant traveling through that expansion valve. And at this point, it's like any evaporator. We're trying to absorb as much heat as possible. We're trying to get as much refrigerant in that coil as possible so we can boil off, have a huge amount of latent heat, and absorb as much heat as possible. But we still need to make sure that we're maintaining the proper superheat. Usually the medium temp, depending on what you're running, if you're running at, like, say, 20 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, this is probably around 26 bar, 28 bar. And you want to make sure that you understand the each set point, because what I've seen also is that if it's the parameters aren't set up correctly, you're going to get maybe oil management fighting the flash tank, flash tank fighting the medium temp side. So this is key. So everything downstream would be that e evaporator temperature, medium temp evaporators. And then when we look at the next one, six, this here is where the refrigerant has to be completely boiled off. So you're hitting your dew point uh, line and you're totally boiling off. So we know that those medium temp transcritical compressor are not getting any liquid back to them. And then you're going to see, I talk about this all the time, is that there's some sort of superheat. It could be a plate heat exchanger. It could be a uh, hot gas injection. It could be coils uh, inside the flash tank. There's so many different designs and depending on the type of superheat for medium or low temp, when we get down to number seven now, this is the, the, at this point, we're entering the low temp evaporators now. So we drop the pressure even more. We're dropping it down to like, say, 200 PSI, say 213, 14, 15 bar, around, around those no numbers. That's where you're going to get down your, your low temp, where you're running at that minus 25, minus 20 to make sure that your product's nice and cool. But as the same thing, you're getting into that low, those low temp evaporators, no different than the systems you're working on, absorbing as much heat as possible out of the product, the frozen product, glass doors, coffin case, whatever it is to, to really have a huge amount of latent heat in those coils to pull as much heat out of the product as possible. And then we get to the next point, which is eight, and this is the leaving the low temperature. Now, everything should be completely boiled off at this point. So you should have that proper superheat if it's set for 12 degrees superheat, 8 degrees superheat, or if it's a floating superheat, you know, based on temperature. So depending on the controllers, you now you're not using superheat sometimes. I see tons and tons of systems that they're not using superheat as a control uh, feature for the case controllers. So it's a floating superheat to maintain pro the best efficiency for that case. So you're going to see more and more of this. So you got to think differently in refrigeration systems in general, not only CO2, you got to think differently because if you can at some point get lower superheat in your evaporator, you're going to have more latent heat. You're going to fill that coil up more. You're going to pull out more heat, but that means you can raise the pressure. That's the big thing. If we can raise the pressure on any evaporator out there, that's where the money is. 
You got to raise the suction pressure, drop the head pressure of that compressor, and you're using less work making money. This is where the customers, the end users, all the big supermarkets, that's where they're going to see the most amount of their savings when you can go and set up their system the most efficiently. When we get to the next point, number nine, number nine. Now, this is the discharge of the low temperature uh, compressors. And this is really, it's been compressed slightly, really above that high stage suction. And what it's doing, it's just making sure that we got that flow because everything goes back into the medium temp compressors. This is why it's called a booster system. And at nine, we have a, uh, we have to have significant superheat. And this is what I've been seeing too on installs when people are doing installs. There's a lot of situation where there's no load on the system. Stores are saying, I need it up and running now. Just get this part up and running. I don't even have case for the other part. And what's happening is that we're starting to, to piece things together to get certain parts running, but you don't have enough load crashing the rack. Lots of times I'm talking to a lot of technicians that they're running into these issues of things like that. So we need to be patient out there. This is complex systems. So next, the next point, so that's nine, that's the discharge. 10, I got 10 here. This is the flash gas bypass line. So this is after the flash gas bypass valve. And really what this is, this is past, uh, a flash gas that's passed through the liquid vapor separator and it's a saturated vapor. And this is running, it could be anywhere between say five, 550, 480 PSI, it, it, depending on the manufacturer, you're going to run a different flash tank and you're going to be opening, that valve is going to be opening and clo closing to maintain a good, good liquid quality going out there. And that flows back into the high stage compressors, those medium temp compressors. You got to understand that everything's going back to these medium temp compressors. When we look at the next point, number 11. So now we have the flash gas bypass valve line coming into it. We have the medium temp suction line coming into uh, this line. And then we get the liquid uh, low temp discharge all coming back to these medium temp compressors. So if something on one of those three starts to malfunction, say it's a case controller on a medium temp suction. If it's the discharge on the low temp compressors, if it's a flash gas bypass, it affects those high pressure uh, compressors or the transcritical compressors. And we need to understand and take our time to be trending graphs, looking at different things. This is what's making technicians amazing right now. I'm talking to some technicians that are blowing my mind. They're coming to the trainings. They're learning from me. They're going out, applying a bunch of the stuff that I'm teaching. And they're coming back and teaching me. They're like, I tried this. I tried this. And I've, I came up with this solution. And this is really what really happened. And really starting to think differently about refrigeration. And this is what I love about the CO2 trainings that I do is that technicians who are going and embracing it and taking the knowledge that I share with them, they're just thinking more outside the box now. And they're trying different things to effectively make that system work and function the best for their customer or their end user. And this is it. This is, this is the step. This is how a transcritical a booster system works. If you want to plot it again, for those who are listening, you have that medium temp discharge. It goes up to your point one through your gas cooler condenser outlet of that gas cooler condenser is point two. When you drop through the high pressure valve, that is point three out of the liquid uh, flash tank or receiver. You go to point four. That's the inlet of your metering device. Point five is the uh, inlet of the evaporator. Point six is the outlet of the evaporator. Point seven is the inlet of the low temp evaporator. And point eight is the outlet of the low temp evaporator. Point nine is the discharge of the low temp compressors. Point 10 is the flash gas bypass line. And point 11 is all three lines together. So this is a little bit about CO2 boosters. And this is the basic stuff. Uh, I, I want to continue to share the fundamentals because it's so important. I think this is what more people need to share. Please share this with others. What you learn here today, I want you to go and talk about it with somebody else. Talk about one or two things that you learned about this. Tell them, head to the Refrigeration Mentor Podcast or the YouTube channel and start learning this because it's here. As regulations start to change and evolve, we're going to see more and more CO2 systems. I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited about it. Once again, lots of CO2 trainings at Refrigeration Mentor. Go check them out and let's get a conversation going. See you at the next CO2 Monday and Refrigeration Mentor Podcast, everyone.